everyone, and welcome to uh, the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Sam Rochel from Auburn University. And this is actually uh, my first uh, interview beyond the uh, introduction I did with uh, Dr. Kelly Wansley, another co-host for the podcast. Uh, so very excited about the first episode today where we get into some technical details about uh, some uh, new data and emerging data that are out there and happy to discuss that uh, with Dr. Uh, Amit Singh, who's currently a postdoctoral researcher at uh, University of Georgia. Hello, Amit. How are you doing? Uh, great. Thank you, Sam, for for introducing, and, and I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing, doing well, doing well, and excited to, to get to talk with you. You and I have had the opportunity to talk a couple times at conferences, never really been at the uh, same place as far as employment at the same time, but we've been able to interact um, at some conferences, so enjoyed getting to, to know you and, and see your work. Um, for the audience out there, uh, could you tell us a little bit uh, about where you're originally from, your graduate training, and kind of what you're doing now? Sure. So I come from Nepal. Uh, I did my undergraduate in a Bachelor's of Veterinary Science and Animal Husbandry from Nepal. And then I worked in Nepal uh, for four years. So I graduated in 2008, and then I worked till 2012 in Nepal. So mostly my work was focused on poultry feed and then providing services to the consumers and then farmers who were getting feeds from the different feed companies. And after that, I moved to uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa. And there I did my master's in animal science and then continued to my PhD in nutrition. So my work has been focused more on poultry nutrition and then during my uh, PhD, I was doing studies involving enzymes, prebiotics, and looking at the gut health of poultry. After finishing my PhD, I joined as a postdoc at the University of Georgia, Athens, and currently I'm working as postdoc here. So I was working in a different lab. It was poultry nutrition lab. I'm currently working in a lab which is more focusing on food safety. So I'm learning more about the uh, microbiome in a different way nowadays. Yeah, very good. Also, uh, a very hot topic for the industry, uh, the nutritional uh, potential to influence uh, food safety, a lot of interest yeah. in, in that as well. Yeah, so, the, po yeah, the post-harvest is uh, more related to pre-harvest safety nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I think uh, we're going to see more uh, more work and more emphasis on that area across all the poultry mm -hmm. departments yeah. in, in the coming year. Great. So, um, yeah, I think today we're going to talk about some of the work you've done uh, around uh, enzymes and prebiotics and the potential interaction there and how we can, you know, really optimize and learn more about the, the fermentation capacity for, for broilers. So can you talk a little bit about that study? Great. So uh, during my PhD, I did uh, many studies uh, involving enzymes. So some of the studies involved enzyme combination. So it was uh, NSPs enzyme like xylanase, amylase, and combined with protease. So those study, I checked the effect on growth performance. So later I wanted to see the effect of enzyme in combination of prebiotics to see how uh, enzymes and prebiotics could work together to function to improve the growth performance and also uh, microbiome diversity in broilers. Uh, so in this study, uh, we used different levels of xylanase enzyme. Uh, it was, uh, there is a recommendation level of xylanase enzyme. So we, we reduced it to half the recommendation and we provided it to the recommendation level. And then we also did same thing with the prebiotics. But in this case, the prebiotic was not used as the level that is generally used in poultry nutrition. Uh, we just wanted to see this was a xylo oligosaccharide prebiotics. So we were more interested in see, in looking at the effect of this prebiotics on those bacteria which could utilize xylo oligosaccharide. So we wanted to see that if the bacteria can utilize this small amount of xylo oligosaccharide and they learn to utilize more from xylon, that is the other like uh, uh, fiber, so they can start uh, utilizing fiber themselves. And the xylanase enzyme would break down those fiber into smaller fragments, so it will be more uh, easier for the bacteria to ferment them. Uh, so in this study, we expected that there would be some interaction of this enzyme and prebiotics, but actually we did not see the interaction. So sometimes uh, there are different reasons behind that. 
uh, in this study, we had a limitation of the number of replicates we used. We used the uh, required replicate based on the previous studies, uh, but still, uh, it it was not a very large number of replicates. So that is something we had limitation in this study. Uh, but other than that, uh, I think we the number of samples were good for microbiome for sorts and fatty acid. But for growth performance, what we see nowadays, since there is a lot of variabilities in broilers, uh, it depends. Like if we have a lot of replicates, it is uh, it is more assertive. The conclusion our conclusions are more assertive. But it's still. What we see, like if you check for the power, the power for the feed conversion ratio is generally good. The power required for feed intake and then average daily gain is actually lower than feed conversion ratio. Maybe it's also best on since that ratio makes it uh, easy, like it is more more balanced when it is in that format. So that might be some of the reason. But it's still in this study, what we found that there was a good effect of Jalanin's enzyme on average daily gain. So uh, that is what we expect, that it would increase the gain. So gain was increased, uh, feed conversion ratio was not affected. So that is why the uh, um, feed intake was also not affected by the enzymes or prebiotics. Uh, prebiotics did not improve average daily gain. So we even did not expect because it was in very less amount. Uh, what we uh, could see that this xylanase enzyme increased sorts and fatty acid, especially acetate, and uh, prebiotic also increased acetate, but there was no interaction. So it was kind of an uh, independent effect of jalanase and prebiotic. Late, we also checked its effect on uh, a velus height, that is for the histomorphology. So we did not find a very strong effect of these things on the velus morphology. Then we also looked at the uh, bacterial diversity. So in overall, the alpha diversity and beta diversity was not affected. So if there is a major difference, then only we see that there is a difference in alpha or beta diversity. But when we went further to see if there was any effect on individual species level, then we found that uh, this xylanase enzyme was increasing the bacteria from the family Rimunococcus. So that family bacteria, especially we see that they are more involved in degrading fibers. And within that, when we looked at specific bacteria, there was one bacteria that is a papili, uh, that is a uh, papillobacter cinnamivorus. So this uh, the the abundance of this bacteria was increased. And when we try to see more information about this bacteria, there is a uh, a very less available information in literature because this bacteria is not cultured well, but still there was some information where where we could uh, understand that this bacteria is able to degrade lignin. So it is breaking down lignin. That is interesting. So we feel that there is something happening, some way that this enzyme is uh, uh, maybe providing some of the uh, metabolites for the bacteria to learn how to utilize the lignin, or somehow there is some changes in the bacterial population and those bacteria which would be breaking down this lignin is increased. So this is something interesting. I also found the uh, same pattern in one more study where I have used salaries enzyme. So this is something I'm interested in looking further when I'm doing other study to see if it is only these enzymes or are also other nutrients that is also providing similar effects. So this is something very interesting we found from this study. Yeah, very good. No, that's that's very interesting. And I think the more you know, we learn about uh, uh, understanding how the microbiome is being effective and uh, per particularly the functionality. You know, you mentioned uh, looking at, at this particular species right. being capable of, of potentially producing enzymes against lignin. Uh, the more we learn about this, I, I think we have a big potential for alternative ingredients, which are often higher fiber, right. less right. well utilized. Yeah. Elevate bird well-being and improve profitability with Cargill's tailored nutrient solutions that deliver performance. Cargill is leading through applied nutrition, leveraging deep nutrient insights and understanding of the animal's nutrient requirements to achieve your production and performance goals. 
Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Singh. It's been great learning more about this study, and hopefully um, people can can reach out and, and find more. And uh, thank, thanks for your time today, and, and really appreciate the, the great information. Yeah, it's great talking to you, Sam. It's a great initiative. You guys are doing this podcast. It is, it is not only useful for people who are not doing research. It's also useful for people like us. We know like what is going on and what is the hot topic, and if we have it. We have any confusion which we are not working on, but those areas we can reach out to the people who are, who are working in those areas. So it's, it's a really great initiative. So I'd like to thank you all for this work. Hey, well, thank you. And, and we really appreciate having you as a guest. And, and hopefully uh, we, can, we can do it again uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you.